Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Sociology. This week, we are going to give you an introduction to the introduction and get started thinking with our sociological imaginations. So what exactly is sociology? Um, the sort of textbook definition is the systematic study of society and social interaction. Uh, sociologists study society. If you want to sort of break it down into the actual direct meaning of the word itself, it does come from the Latin companion and the Greek logos study of. So we're really studying interactions between people and groups of people as a whole. So what is a society exactly, right? So you could very easily say that sociology is the study of society, which is studied by sociology, and we could go around in a circle forever. But a society is a group of people whose members interact, reside in a definable area, and share a culture. So what is culture then? Because a lot of people tend to maybe want to use those two words interchangeably. Um, we will learn more about culture when we get to our culture chapter. But culture is basically the sort of beliefs and way of life of a people. The things we believe, the things we value, the things that we consume. That is what culture is. A society, those are the people who believe that stuff, if that makes any sense. So how does a sociologist look at the world? We sort of like to think of society as a sort of big, kind of giant thing, and then us as individuals, and we tend to sort of separate the two. However, when it comes to being a sociologist, we can't necessarily separate our individual interactions and even our individual choices from wider society. Everything is connected. So that is a sort of fancy word for it is figuration. We look at not only the individual behavior, but the society that shapes the behavior simultaneously. It's like we're thinking about, um, maybe an example could be, um, say, buying, buying a MacBook, right? Or buying an iPhone. That could be seen as an individual choice, but a sociologist wouldn't just see an iPhone as an individual choice. We could look at why it is that the person chooses to buy the iPhone. We can look at the way that our society works that sort of tells us to get this new hot phone every year. We can look at the ads that sell us this phone and that tell us that we need this piece of technology in our lives, right? So all of these things come together into what someone would think might be just an arbitrary choice of what phone it is that I'm going to get. Sociologists see it as more of a wider conversation between the individual and the society. So, let's take a journey to our sociological imagination land. Um, when we look at the world as sociologists, we use what C. Wright Mills calls our sociological imagination. And this guy wrote an entire book about the sociological imagination in about 1959 or so, and you will actually read an excerpt of the sociological imagination this week. And what is the sociological imagination? When you use your sociological imagination, you are able to look at your own history and the pasts of others in relation to history and social structure, right? So. Let's take the example of that iPhone. When you use your sociological imagination, you don't just see you buying an iPhone anymore. When you use your sociological imagination, you think about all of the things in society that are wrapped up in that, from the ads that sell it, from your own history with technology, the wider history of technology and how fast it moves, the idea that you have to spend a significant amount of money to buy an iPhone, and some people have access to that kind of money, and others don't, right? 
So an iPhone is for a particular person, right? So when you're using your sociological imagination, you are thinking about all of these things. You're able to think about all of that stuff instead of sort of taking your individual choices for granted. So how did we get here to studying this thing called sociology in the first place? Well, I'll tell you. We've been doing this sociology thing for a pretty long time. Um, and there were people that were doing sociology before the word sociology even existed. For example, this guy Ma Tuan Lin from the 13th century was a Chinese historian. And rather than sort of write down specific facts like this person went to war with this person on this date, and then the war was over. He actually was able to write down why it is that the war was caused, right? And what kinds of social dynamics were a part of historical development. Not just the fact that there might have been a war, but who it was that was having that disagreement, what life was like at the time, um, how it was that people could be affected by these changes in history. So, he was pretty much doing sociology before sociology was a thing. This other guy, Ibn Khaldun, was another sort of proto-sociologist, right? He was a historian and a philosopher. And, again, another guy that didn't just deal in facts of history, but he also developed theories of why society works the way it works, and what causes social change. So he was thinking sort of above and beyond just reporting facts. He was trying to figure out why it is that things were the way they were, and he was even doing some cross-cultural comparisons, which made him sort of dip a toe into anthropology, if you will. So he was doing sociology before sociology was a thing. So now when did sociology become a thing? The actual word sociology happened around 1780 by this guy Emmanuel Joseph Saiz, but the problem is um, that you can have a word but not necessarily a discipline. So while we can credit Emmanuel Joseph for giving us the word sociology, we didn't have sociology itself until Auguste Comte, who is considered the father of sociology. And his belief was that back in the 1700s, you had this wonderful thing called the Enlightenment in the Western world and a big scientific revolution. Science was the jam. Everybody loved it, right? And particularly we were studying the natural sciences. We were doing a lot of biology, a lot of chemistry, a lot of physics. Auguste Comte thought that we could study society using the exact same scientific methods used in natural sciences. And if you've ever had to do a science fair project, you may be very well familiar with the scientific method itself. He thought that we could apply the same scientific method to studying actual groups of people. And that belief that we can study social patterns using actual science, that is called positivism that we can be scientific, and more importantly, that we can report things from those scientific studies as objective facts. Unfortunately, this guy Karl Marx, you might have heard of him, didn't necessarily believe that. He actually rejected um, this whole idea of objective scientific study of society, and he developed his his own sort of theory about the way that society works. Um, his big thing is conflict. If you ever actually go into sociology, there's one big branch of sociology called conflict theory, which we'll get into in a second, but he is the guy that pretty much invented conflict theory. If you've ever heard of socialism, it's pretty much this guy's fault. And he basically believed that the way that societies grow and change is because of a constant struggle, a constant conflict between social classes over the means of production. So a higher class owns the factories, then there are the workers that work in the factories, 
Maybe they're not necessarily getting paid a good enough wage, they are a different social class, and there's a constant struggle between them. And this is how sort of revolutions get started, this is how society changes. And that's what Karl Marx believed. Now, there are a lot of people sort of thinking about sociology and thinking about it in terms of how to look at the world, but it wasn't actually something that was taught in school until about 1895 when Emil Durkheim established the first Euro European Department of Sociology. And he was a positivist, and he thought that sociologists could study these objective social facts. One of his most famous works was about uh, suicide rates in one particular area, and he saw a pattern arise where he saw that Protestants, um, people of the sort of Protestant branch of Christianity, um, they committed suicide far more often than Catholics did. He saw a pattern there, and he sought to try and find out the reason why. Um, in a nutshell, of course, it's a really, really, really thick book, so a very, very kind of Cliff Notes version of the conclusion is that through Catholicism, you have a very hierarchical structure where you have the Pope and you've got bishops and archbishops and archdioceses and all sorts of people making all sorts of rules as to how it is that you can interpret the Word of God. You as a person, um, as a religious person, you would go to church to get that interpretation of the Word of God, of the Bible, through a priest. And that priest has a whole bunch of people, an entire chain of command, to answer to, right? Um, but that is the only way that you can get your relationship with God, is to go to church and get it from a priest, do your confessions, do all your sacraments, all that fun stuff. Protestants, on the other hand, in general, um, they believe that you can get a personal relationship with God and people can interpret the Bible in however many different ways, right? God speaks to you directly, you don't need a priest necessarily, right? Now, when you think about people and the way that opinions work, everybody's got an opinion. And it is no different when you think about an interpretation of the Bible, which is why there are sort of very few splits recorded in Catholicism because of this really, really strong hierarchical culture. Um, but when you have Protestantism, where every single person can have a different interpretation of the Bible, you can have a different denomination of a Christian church for every interpretation. So you have your Baptists, your Methodists, your Lutherans, your Calvinists, all sorts of people. And they each have their own interpretation on how the way the world works and how God works, right? Because of this individuality, you don't necessarily have the kind of support system that Catholicism does. Um, in Catholicism, there is a bigger support system. You have to go to church in order to get your sort of godly word, and you get to know people there, right? Whereas in Protestantism, you're kind of on your own. And the solidarity of Catholicism makes it so that you are less likely to commit the act of suicide, whereas Protestantism is actually pretty individualistic and you're kind of on your own. So that's pretty much what Emile Durkheim found, right? And this is sociology at work, just using kind of these rates of suicide and trying to find what social facts are behind that. Max Weber, on the other hand, he's another guy that did not necessarily believe in the scientific study of things. He was what is called an anti-positivist, right? Did not believe in using the scientific method to study people, because we're people. We are unique. We have our own opinions, um, and social researchers should strive for subjectivity. When you look at the sort of science working of sociology, People want to make predictions as to what society is going to look like 10, 15, 100 years from now. And they want to make wider generalizations about the whole entire world and try to describe why it is that everybody is the way everybody is. Max Weber, on the other hand, he just wants to understand the world. He doesn't want to predict it scientifically. 
He doesn't want to define everybody scientifically. He just wants to understand the world a little bit better and strive for subjectivity here. We're not trying to go for actual concrete facts. He realizes that things change, people change, and we just want to get to know the world a little bit better. We don't need to get all scientific with it. Now, one major part of any sort of discipline are these kind of major theories, and sociology is no different. Um, you've probably heard of the theory of relativity. Um, sociology has its own funky theories as well. So what is an actual theory? In terms of sociology, a theory is a way to explain different aspects of social interactions, and we can actually kind of test these things uh, through our work. There are two kinds of theories. There are grand theories that kind of try to explain life, the universe, and everything. And there are micro-level theories that are very, very specific relationships between individuals or small groups of people. So a grand theory would be something like conflict theory that tries to kind of put everybody under the same box. These, these things are the same way around the world. Whereas micro-level theory is more like in this particular karaoke bar, <laughs> things work in this particular way. That is a micro-level theory. Now, any major part of any academic discipline is what is called a paradigm. And what are paradigms? In short, you know, you have that nice big old definition there, but paradigms are kind of the rules of the road for anybody who wants to work within a particular discipline. So, it's the rule book. It tells you, if you are a sociologist, these are the kinds of research you can do. These are a list of all of the theories that you can work from, and eventually you can develop your own, but you have to kind of reference one, one of these many, many theories to do so. Uh, these are the words that that you have to use, right? This is the vocabulary that is used in sociology. This is how you do science. This is how you do research. This is how you don't do research, for example. So, basically, a paradigm tells you how it is that you're supposed to do sociology or chemistry or biology. The same word isn't going to mean the exact same thing from a sociologist to a biologist, for example. And paradigms help define those terms for us. So now we are going to go into some of the actual big, major, grand theories in sociology. Um, there are pretty much, there's a whole bunch of them, but we are going to focus on three. And whenever we get to any sort of different topic, you are likely to see these pop up again and again. So there is a functionalist perspective on race or technology or gender, etc. Uh, there is a conflict theory approach and there's a symbolic interactionist theory. These are just big major ways to see the world and hey, by the end of the class you might find yourself identifying with one of these more than the other. So let's start with functionalism. A functionalist believes that society is a structure with interrelated parts designed to meet the biological and social needs of individuals within that society. What does that even mean? Everything has its place. Everything has its purpose. Everything has a reason to be there. Everything in society serves a particular purpose, serves a particular function. And what are these things? These things we call social facts. Social facts are things like laws and morals and values, all sorts of things that govern social life. And each social fact has a particular function. Now, let's pick a social fact like... Hmm, well, a social fact can even be something like a dress code, right? Or a norm. So let's go to a particular social norm that you might be familiar with, which is the school uniform, right? And this school uniform has a variety of functions. 
Some of them are manifest, some of them are latent, right? So what is a manifest function? This is something, this is a function, this is a, a, a sort of purpose that is explicit, this is the reason we want to do something. It is the anticipated function of something. So what is the manifest function of a school uniform? Um, some would say that the reason that you have school uniforms is so that uh, you can easily identify yourself as a student of whatever school that you're in, right? So that people can easily identify who's a student and who's not, right? So that could be one manifest function of the school uniform. A latent uh, function is one that is an unintended consequence of a social process. So while we might intend for the school uniform to be a way to identify us as members of this particular college or school, um, a latent function of the school uniform would be it promotes conformity. Some would say that the cool thing about school uniforms that isn't necessarily intended but is an, a, it is a consequence of having a school uniform is that because everybody looks the same, because everybody has to wear the same thing, people won't get made fun of as much for wearing weird clothes or not having the latest design or fashion. Um, there's less uh, sort of visible class distinctions when you wear a school uniform versus if you don't. So it makes everybody the same. It makes everybody equal. That could be a latent function of a school uniform. Right? So that is that is the difference between a manifest uh, a manifest function and a latent function. Um, if you want another example, we could think of uh, the speed limit, right? So the law that is the speed limit. Um, some people would say that it is so that um, it keeps people safe, right? Laws keep people safe and govern people. Um, other people would say that, um, that that might be the manifest function of the speed limit is to keep people safe so that they don't drive too fast and hurt themselves. A latent function of the speed limit is that it creates, you know, it sort of slows us down. It controls us. It keeps us passive. We should have the choice to be able to drive however the heck fast we want. I mean, it is Miami. We pretty much end up probably doing that anyway. But a latent function would be that most laws are designed to sort of keep us under the thumb of the government, right? However, Explicitly, we will say that the manifest function of law is to keep us safe, right? So there you go. Manifest and latent functions. Another grand theory is conflict theory. So if you remember our BFF Karl Marx back there, he was the guy who pretty much came up with conflict theory. And conflict theory is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, society is a constant competition for very, very limited resources. Some people have a lot of resources, other people don't. And social structures, whether that is a law, education, all sorts of sort of different social institutions, they reflect this competition in their inherent inequalities. Uh, one of the most famous uh, discussions of conflict theory has to do specifically with um, economic class. So we think of the upper class, the middle class, the lower class. All of these things are in constant competition for resources, food, shelter, money, etc. The third one is, third sort of major grand theory of sociology is symbolic interactionist theory. And it is all about looking at what things symbolize. Humans act towards those things on the basis of the meanings they ascribe to those things. And we interact um, with people, and those people and wider society teaches us what certain things mean. And we're constantly developing different definitions of what things are. So what if I said the word apple? 
What was the first thing that came to your mind? Was it the fruit? It could have been um, the sort of symbol of original sin in the Garden of Eden, Eve eating an apple. Or it could have been, you know, the Steve Jobs apple. Maybe you would have thought of the apple uh, that hit um, Isaac Newton in the head, right? And that's how he figured out this whole gravity thing, right? The apple could mean a variety of different things, but we put a very significant amount of meaning behind certain symbols. So, I show you an apple, and depending on what that apple looks like, you will have a variety of different meanings ascribed to it, and you will act towards it in a different way. So, depending on whether you are an apple user, or maybe you are a PC person, or Maybe you have an iPhone or maybe you have an Android phone or something, right? So depending on what meaning you ascribe to that word apple, you might act towards it in a different way. Um, this isn't necessarily a, a, a grand theory, but this would be considered a sort of subset of symbolic interactionism. And uh, this is one that I actually quote a lot in my own research, and it actually sort of makes a good amount of, of sense for people that are sort of starting off in sociology, so I like to bring it up. And one sort of way of looking at it is, um, if you want a sort of simplistic way of sort of boiling down uh, Goffman's way of looking at the world, it is that all the world's a stage, and we are merely players. And Everybody has a variety of different roles, and they can play a bunch of different roles in any given day. At one point, right now you're listening to me, that makes you a student. But after that, you might be somebody's son, somebody's daughter. Um, the way that you may interact with me would probably be different than the way that you interact with your parents, with your best friends, uh, maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Um, or maybe your best friend versus an acquaintance versus maybe somebody that you don't know but you're friends with on Facebook or something, right? All of these different roles have their own scripts. Um, they have even their own dress codes. And you act differently, you dress differently, um, maybe sometimes you even feel differently, look differently, depending on what role you're playing at any given time. So when you are sort of on stage, when you are in this role of student, that is sort of said to be your front stage self, where you're sort of kind of acting um, and interacting within that role. Then there is your backstage self, um, which Goffman would probably consider your quote-unquote real self, um, and that is sort of who you are when the camera's off. Um, when, when you sort of stop being a student and you go home, you know, maybe you don't have the same language of a student anymore, um, and you are sort of quote-unquote your real self. Now, I have a tendency to disagree uh, with Goffman on this point because I think that there isn't necessarily any difference between a front stage and a backstage self. These are all real selves. And it's interesting to consider this idea of sort of front stage versus backstage self um, because he was writing about this at a time when we didn't have cell phones and we weren't tweeting and we didn't have social media or take selfies or anything. Um, and he thought about somebody who would go out into the world, work, um, in whatever job they had, and then come home, and then in the privacy of their own home, be their backstage self. On the other hand, um, our sort of everyday social performance, especially now because of social media and, you know, 
most every phone you get has a camera, um, we're always um, kind of on and we are always performing a kind of what is called um, impression management. Um, there isn't necessarily a backstage self necessarily. There's no true self. You are constantly constructing uh, your self. Uh, you're constantly constructing your real self, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. And there you go. So um, I hope you enjoyed this sort of sociological uh, introduction. This is basically just a really, really big overview of how it is that we got here uh, thinking about sociology. Um, what I recommend you do now is you read C. Wright Mills' uh, excerpt from The Sociological Imagination and take a crack at the discussion. Uh, the discussion question asks you to basically just tell me a little bit about yourself so that I can get to know you all. Uh, should be fairly easy and um, it is due uh, Sunday the 12th at midnight, right? So I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you, and I will see you all next week.